We open today with the grim news of yet another terror attack in Israel. Nine people were injured when a terrorist went on a stabbing spree in multiple locations in Hadera earlier today. The injured were evacuated to the hospital for treatment, and the suspect, who was later identified as Ahmed Jabirin, a 36-year-old from Umm al-Fahim, was neutralized by security forces. Several hours later, a barrage of rockets from Lebanon struck the north in Kiryat Shmona, killing two Israelis in the afternoon in a direct hit. Now, the north of Israel has been under a continuing barrage of rocket fire from Hezbollah throughout the day. Hofa Carmel, Akko, and other towns and cities in the Galilee are being targeted throughout the day. ILTV's Devil Klein has the latest. Hezbollah has been firing at the Carmel and the western and upper Galilee. This after Hezbollah fired more than 100 rockets at the Israeli port city of Haifa and surroundings. The ongoing shelling has been the heaviest yet on Israel's third largest city. Most of the rockets were intercepted by the Iron Dome system, although some got through, exploding in the Haifa suburbs of Kiryat Yan and Kiryat Motzkin. A woman in her 70s was wounded in the arm by falling shrapnel. <laughs> The skies above the city have been filled with white trails of the interceptor rockets rising to meet the incoming barrages and explosions as sirens wailed and hundreds of thousands of Israelis ran for shelter. After weeks of pounding by the IDF, Hezbollah is separating its actions from Gaza for the first time and is calling for a ceasefire with Israel unrelated to the continuing war in Gaza. The call came with three IDF divisions advancing in South Lebanon and continuing waves of airstrikes of Hezbollah leadership and missile firing capabilities. More from ILTV's Steve Leibowitz. Appearing shaken and unsure, Hezbollah Deputy Leader Naim Qasim said the group supported the efforts of Speaker of Parliament Nabi Berry, a Hezbollah ally, to secure a ceasefire without providing further details on any conditions demanded by Hezbollah. Until now, Hezbollah has insisted that it will continue firing at Israel until a ceasefire is reached in the war in Gaza. Israeli analysts say that with so many Hezbollah leaders killed and wounded, the group is becoming desperate for a halt in fighting. This ceasefire call from Hezbollah came as IDF operations in South Lebanon continue to advance. The 98th Division killed 200 Hezbollah members this week, demolishing terror tunnels and capturing weapons in several Lebanese towns near the border. More than 100 tons of explosives have been used by the division to demolish Hezbollah sites above and below ground. The Air Force bombardments continue with waves of attacks on Hezbollah leadership in Beirut and rockets and rocket launchers in the Beka Valley. The IDF said it destroyed a Hezbollah tunnel that crossed into Israel but had no exit point. According to the Army, the tunnel crossed the UN-recognized Blue Line by about 10 meters. No Israeli towns were under any threat by the tunnel. Massive amounts of weapons have been recovered from what appear to be normal homes in South Lebanon. <laughs> Prime Minister Netanyahu sent a message directly addressing the Lebanese people. In his message, the Prime Minister blamed Iran and Hezbollah, claiming that they led the Lebanese into this war and urged citizens that the time was right for the Lebanese people to rise up against the terrorists that brought them such great suffering. Let's hear his message. We've degraded Hezbollah's capabilities. We took out thousands of terrorists, including Nasrallah himself and Nasrallah's replacement, and the replacement of his replacement. Today, Hezbollah is weaker than it's been for many, many years. Now you, the Lebanese people, you stand at a significant crossroads. It is your choice. You can now take back your country. You can return it to a path of peace and prosperity. If you don't, Hezbollah will continue to try to fight Israel from densely populated areas at your expense. Tensions between the U.S. and Israel are rising once again as questions loom about Israel's response to the Islamic regime in Iran. 
On Wednesday, Prime Minister Netanyahu refused to allow Defense Minister Yoav Gallant to visit the U.S. and conduct meetings with U.S. officials until Netanyahu himself speaks with President Biden. Gallant was set to meet with his counterpart in the U.S. and discuss Israel's planned response for an attack on Iran. But surprisingly, the topic still has not been discussed between the two heads of state. Prime Minister Netanyahu has been waiting for President Biden to call for 10 days to discuss this same topic. Trust between the two nations is strained as a byproduct of Israel not sharing information on strikes prior to attacks, for example, the pager attack on Hezbollah. Meanwhile, the Islamic regime in Iran has threatened to escalate further if Israel strikes key sensitive sites, such as oil fields, a strike that could cripple the Iranian economy and make a weak Islamic regime even weaker. The Israeli response to the regime's ballistic missile barrage will likely include regime intelligence sites, military bases, but not the controversial nuclear program sites. On Tuesday, the regime warned a strike on infrastructure such as oil fields would be a red line and would impact the severity of the regime's next strike. President Biden has also urged Israel to consider other options and has stated he does not support striking the nuclear facilities. While a final decision from the security cabinet has not been made, it is clear what direction the Biden administration is pushing, attempting to preserve more of the status quo with the Islamic regime in Iran. Here to discuss the next steps for Israel when it comes to striking the Islamic Republic of Iran is Iran expert and researcher Benny Sabti. Benny, thank you so much for joining us. I, I want to start by asking you, what is the impact of striking the oil fields in Iran, and, and why is that a controversial move? I mean, we see Biden hesitant. We see the IRGC already threatening over it. What impact would a strike on the oil fields have on this regime? Hello, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I think the fear of U.S. is uh, about uh, the reaction of Iran regime against uh, Saudi Arabia or other Arab countries and their oil fields, at, as it happened in uh, 2019 or uh, 20, as uh, they attacked their oil uh, fields. So, and they don't want to jeopardize the American and Western uh, interests in this area, but. I think that maybe Israel uh, should think about other uh, other uh, interests of Iran regime to attack. I don't know if it's the best thing to attack the oil fields or, or even nuclear uh, facilities, because the nuclear issue is not uh, uh, in the final uh, stage yet, and, and oil fields are very uh, old. So the damage won't be so uh, high. I think after the experience with the uh, uh, higher figures of uh, Nas uh, Hezbollah when we uh, illuminated, uh, eliminated uh, Nasrallah and other figures, maybe it's better to, uh, to go for the Iranian regime leaders also, or maybe IRGC uh, generals, because these are the engines of acting against Israel. The terror attacks are coming from their minds and their hands. The weapons to Hamas and to Hezbollah are coming from them. The money and the training also are coming from IRGC uh, generals. So if we see that they are so afraid from uh, attacking these personnel, and we see uh, General Kaani hiding for so many days uh, and, and disappearing, uh, because maybe he's afraid of, of being attacked, so I think that this has a lot of uh, reason uh, to go for them and not for the facilities that also Iranians can uh, build, the, rebuild them again. Good point. Very good point. Uh, also something important to consider for the day after this regime falls. I want to ask you about the Iranian people. How do you expect that the public in Iran would respond to Israel striking any of these sites, but in particular IRGC sites? Well, from what I hear in the social media and, and uh, other places, I see that the regime is also worried uh, from uh, its people. It can be another front. The Iranian people are very happy and are actually anticipating, are waiting for this attack to come or maybe to rescue them. They think uh, about the final uh, act. They think that the regime is going to fall. I'm not sure that the regime will fall after one or two attacks. But it gives them a lot of hope. You know, about 60 to 80 percent of the Iranian people didn't come to vote in the presidential uh, elections or parliament elections. This means 
they are against the regime. They are not with the regime. So if there are so many people, so many millions that can be very happy uh, if Israel or other countries attack uh, Iran regime and Iran regime only facilities, not the uh, dams and not the electric uh, power uh, factories, just the facilities or the uh, figures of the regime. So maybe we have so many allies in the other side that they can take the, the thing, uh, the actions to themselves and bring a better day uh, for Iran tomorrow. Absolutely. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, so we have to wrap this up. But I want to thank you for joining us today and shedding some light on what we may see in the coming weeks. Thank you. Well, new comments have emerged, reportedly said by U.S. President Biden, slamming Prime Minister Netanyahu as a leader and as a person in general. Now, in studio with me is ILTV's Ariella Lahiani. So, Ariella, what can you tell us about this, this situation, this book that was just released by Bob Woodward? So it's no secret that the relationship between Biden and Netanyahu has been fairly rocky since the beginning of the war. Biden has publicly and on multiple occasions denounced the way uh, Netanyahu has been handling this war. But now author Bob Woodward has uh, released a book uh, in which he's revealed some of the comments Biden has made behind closed doors. Uh, I'll refrain from using the same profanities he's used, but he's called by uh, Netanyahu a liar, a bad guy, uh, and other comments, which, as I said... Other expletives, uh, Exactly, yes. <laughs> that I won't say because it's, it's too explicit for our viewers. Um, but it's really sad to see this. You know, America's Israel's strongest ally. And to see the relationship between the two leaders deteriorate in such a manner is upsetting and really worrying. The two leaders are meant to hold uh, a call today to discuss Israel's response to Iran. Of course, the US will push for Israel to keep it as tamed as possible. Um, but we'll have to see how that goes. It's, it's unknown as of now. Well, let's hope that that relationship can be repaired. It's lasted a very long time. I expect it to continue, but never good to hear tension between two allies. Thank you, Ariella. Do you want to transform your love to Israel into a meaningful action? Well, ILTV is proud to partner with Blessed by Israel, a company that brings you extraordinary products handcrafted by the brave pioneers of Judea and Samaria. Every purchase supports their mission and strengthens Israel's heartland. Let's take a closer look at Blessed by Israel and how you can make a difference today. Support Israel with every purchase you make from Blessed by Israel. The goods they offer from families of the biblical heartland are more than just wonderful products. They're a statement of solidarity and an investment in Israel's future. When you shop at blessedbyisrael.com, you stand against boycotts and uplift the resilient pioneers rebuilding their homeland. Make your purchase count today. Visit blessedbyisrael.com. Shop now and become part of strengthening Israel's roots and securing a bright future. This week, the country is commemorating the anniversary of the October 7th massacre with a series of events and interviews. ILTV's Mayan Hoffman sat down with United Hatzalah Psycho Trauma first responder and EMT Neely Zivan, who left her young children at home in southern Israel on October 7th to help save lives. Let's take a look at some excerpts from that conversation. Neely, thank you so much for being here. So I want you to take me back to the morning of October 7th. When did you start to realize that the unimaginable was happening? Well, my day started at 6.30 in the morning. Um, there were explosions right outside of my community. Uh, we live in the middle of the Negev. Uh, where we live, we actually do not get rockets or sirens usually. So we already knew that something unusual was happening. Um, we all, uh, although it was Saturday and we observed Shabbat, um, we opened our phones because we understood that something was happening. Fast forward a little into the day, I got my first call as a psychotrauma first responder. There were Nova Festival um, survivors who had uh, fled, fl fled from, the, from the party just as the terrorists were arriving. They had picked up someone into their car. Um, and I was called basically to do first uh, response uh, psychotrauma. And while I was speaking with them, I understood from them that there were terrorists, hundreds and tens of terrorists, just driving around on motorcycles. And already then, I, I understood that that's, that's something really, really crazy. That day, you treated, as we said, soldiers, civilians, people with emotional and traumatic uh, challenges, and also people with physical issues. What was the most difficult part of the whole day? 
think the hardest part of that day was uh, when we had arrived at Urim base that had just been evacuated from soldiers. After there were battles going on there, it was really quiet when we got there. There were about 12 ambulances, Hatsala, Amada, um, and Army. And it was supposed to be a point where they were going to bring injured people. And from there, we were going to evacuate them ASAP. And we sat, we sat there for about two hours waiting for them to bring people. And only a few people had come. And that's because they couldn't get to you. They couldn't, they couldn't get to us. Most of them were stuck in their homes. There were terrorists everywhere up until a little where we, next to where we were. And for that reason, um, we, we understood already how bad it is if they can't even get to us. It's been a year since October 7th. Looking back, what kind of perspective on life has, has your perspective on life changed? And how has your volunteer work with United Hatsala been different after this experience? I, I believe in mankind, and I believe in the, in the better. And although there's a small fraction of very evil people in the world, um, I'm not going to let them ruin that for me. Um, so I think that that's where my mind is, and that's pretty much what keeps me going from there on. Amazing. What message do you want to share with others who may be grappling with the trauma of the day? And how do you find the strength to keep helping those in need after all you've been through yourself? Well, I think if I take the fact that I believe in the better, um, and I believe that you know if there's a down, then there has to be an up, um, and there, there will be better days, and we have to believe it, because otherwise we won't be able to wake up in the morning. And we have seen better days, um, so I think that there's no reason for us to not to believe that that will come. Um, and as, as dark as it may feel sometimes, um, sometimes we have to believe that there's going to be light at the end of the tunnel. Um, well, Neely, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. The atrocities of October 7th, 2023 are forever carved into our minds. As we marked one year since that profoundly painful day, ILTV's Sivan Raviv sat down with Israel Bond's president and CEO, Danny Neve, to learn more about how each of us can do our part. Let's take a look. Under Danny Neves leadership, Israel Bonds has not only continued its mission of supporting the economic strength and prosperity of Israel, but is also meeting the challenges our generation faces. One year after the tragic events of October 7th, Danny is here to share how Israel Bonds has rallied global support for Israel. Its new Invest in Life campaign is a powerful initiative that calls on supporters worldwide to make a meaningful investment in Israel's future. Danny, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. October 7, 2023 marked a dark day for Israel and the Jewish people. What does this day personally represent to you and to Israel Bonds as an organization, and how has it shaped the past year? Yes, a year has passed, and we still uh, struggle to comprehend the unimaginable atrocities uh, committed on that day. And we ache for the hostages still held in Gaza. We ache for the families of the brave soldiers who sacrificed their life. What a heavy price to pay losing a husband, a son, a father. We ache for the injured soldiers who fought with valor and would bear the scars of this war for the rest of their life. And as regard to Israel Bonds, I can tell you that for seven decades, Israel Bonds mission was to secure funds for the state of Israel. And we have raised more than $52 billion during the years, ushering Israel into a vibrant startup nation. But since October 7th, our mission has felt more vital, more urgent, more emotional. And October 7th has galvanized Israel bound supporters around the world like never before. How did Israel Bonds respond in the immediate aftermath of the attack, and what impact has that had? On that heinous day, we initiated a special campaign to support Israel. And I'm grateful and proud to share with you that since the war broke out, we have raised more than $3.6 billion, record-breaking numbers, really three times our average annual sales. And these funds have been an essential lifeline in ensuring Israel's economy resilience. But these are not just financials. Investments in Israel bonds are a strong statement of solidarity with the people of Israel. What has been the most moving part of this journey for you personally, if I may ask? Probably uh, meeting 
investors from all walks of life has been incredibly moving, from bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah students, bank CEOs, local governments, uh, treasurers, and individuals investors. And the overwhelming desire to make an impact in Israel's time of need is inspiring. And our investors understand that if you invest in Israel bonds, you make a bond with Israel. And this collective commitment has shown me that in the face of adversity, the support for Israel is still very strong. Can you tell us a bit more about the Invest in Life campaign and why it's so significant at this moment? As the, uh, the war continued, we knew that we can and we should do more for Israel. And we initiated that Invest in Life campaign, inviting people to invest at least, at least $107 as a tribute to the victims and the heroes of October 7th. If I, if I may, I would like to call upon each and every one of you. Join this campaign. Make a strong statement of support for Israel. Go to israelbonds.com. If you haven't opened an account, you can open an account today and then move ahead with your purchase. If you already have an account, you may be asked to change your password because we moved to a new uh, website. Go to israelbonds.com and make your purchase and make this important statement of support for Israel. A QR code is on the screen. By joining Israel Bond's Invest in Life campaign, you play a part in ensuring that Israel is strong and her future is secured. Join Israel Bonds by investing $107 or any other amount of your choosing and support Israel, showing the world that we will persevere through adversity. Thank you. In contrast to what we saw in France on October 7th, nearly 4,000 supporters of Israel from 27 cities across Finland marched to counter the anti-Israel protests and honor the victims of the Hamas massacre and ongoing war. The demonstrations were organized by the Israel Friendship Committee in Finland, representing 20 pro-Israel Jewish and Christian groups. Speakers included parliament members, professors and volunteers from the Hostages and Missing Families Forum. The event went smoothly with only one minor incident when a young immigrant attempted to attack a journalist but was arrested by the police. Risto Huvila, chair of the Federation of Finland-Israel Associations, told ILTV this marked the first time such a pro-Israel event received mainstream media coverage. Even leading the evening news on Finland's top TV channel, TV1. Sagot Winery, where passion meets tradition. Nestled in the heart of Binyamin, our vineyards yield exquisite wines crafted with generations of expertise. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Mostly clear skies are expected tonight around the country with temperatures reaching lows of around 19 degrees Celsius or 67 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow, mostly sunny skies and warm weather are expected as temperatures should climb to reach highs of 29 degrees Celsius or 85 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a wrap for today's news. For the latest updates from Israel on all your devices, be sure to follow our ILTV channels, subscribe to our newsletter, and explore our website, ILTV.tv. Stay informed with the latest news straight from the heart of Israel. I'm Emily Trader. Be well, and thank you so much for watching.